flying into the Beijing airport, which is one of the largest airports in the world, and having it be completely closed and just a ghost town, nothing there. Um, like hazmat suits and stuff? Yeah, everyone in hazmat suits and like cameras everywhere and, and just them just like, I don't know, monitoring everything from afar, kind of feeling like lab rats getting like kind of, I don't know, pushed through this labyrinth of, of plastic tunnels and things and just like, it, it felt like, it felt like, like landing on a different planet, like an alien planet and just being like uh, carted through like you're in a movie. Greetings, everyone. This is Eric Henry Anderson and welcome to another episode of Conversations for Convergence, a curious podcast exploring myriad topics, including music and the arts, health and wellness, culture, science, high performance, and many others. Today's guest is Travis Ganong. Travis is an American World Cup and Olympic alpine ski racer, specializing in the speed events of downhill and super G. He was born and raised in Truckee, California, and was a member of the Squaw Valley Ski Team, now Palisades Tahoe. Travis earned a silver medal in the downhill at the 2015 World Championships in Beaver Creek, Colorado. He's competed in two Olympic Games, first in Sochi in 2014, and last year in Beijing. Ganong also has two World Cup downhill wins to his name and is regarded as one of the top U.S. downhillers of the last decade. In this episode, Travis and I discuss early season training in Chile, Travis's lifelong love for skiing, regardless of the weather conditions, how sports science has changed and allowed athletes to extend their careers much later into life than in previous generations, the interplay between the technical, tactical, physical, and mental aspects of ski racing, how training on dogleg at Squaw Valley prepared him for World Cup racing, the World Cup coming to Palisades Tahoe this February, and Palisades' ongoing Olympic bid, learning to view ski racing as a professional pursuit, especially with regards to physical conditioning, the bizarre Beijing Olympics, and scheming to escape to a nearby hot springs while there, Travis's ski racing inspirations, Darren Ralves and Marco Sullivan, the elusive Kitzbühel podium, Travis's company, Pacific Crest Coffee, and what life might look like after ski racing, and various other topics. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Olympic ski racer, Travis Ganong. All right, Travis Ganong, thank you so much for joining me. Um, so you were just down in uh, Chile training, right? Yeah, I just got back. Well, I got back about 10 days ago, and then I'm leaving to go back down to Chile in three days. So uh, we left all of our stuff down there, and um, I came home for a little break and then go back for some more skiing. Sweet. So winter in Chile, a little Tahoe summer, and then uh, getting right back to the grind, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty crazy. You can hop on an airplane and magically be transported from summer <laughs> straight to winter. And it's like a shock to the system, but it's pretty cool. It's like, it's like February, March kind of in Chile right now. That's the equivalent of their season. Right. So it's kind of the end of their se- end of their winter. Um, yeah. It's awesome. I mean, the last 20 years of my ski career, I've always made the trip down to South America or mm-hmm. New Zealand. And it's kind of part of what we do. Um, right. Lots of time on the road, lots of time living in a bag, but this year in particular uh, was probably the best summer ski trip of my life. It was it was insane. The first trip we did, um, down like tra- tra- training wise, or just because it snowed a lot, or um, both. So so I, yeah, I don't, after the um, after the Olympics last year and like the crazy last couple of years with COVID, I was pretty burnt mm. out. Yeah. And so this spring, I took a huge break from racing and training, and mm. and didn't really do anything with the team until two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And then I showed up to the camp down there and I was like fresh and excited and just ready again. Um, and, and then it snowed two feet when we got there and I got to go powder skiing. And then I got linked up to go uh, heli skiing one day, which was nice real cool. And then the like downhill super G training conditions were all time. So like just all, everything kind of lined up. So, so how did that happen? then? if you guys got all that snow, I mean, I mean, how did you get the great, downhill and super G training conditions. I mean, I would just assume if it snowed a bunch, it would kind yeah. of be lame for a while, but. Um, yeah. So we, like the first couple of days were soft, um, mm-hmm. but without those two feet of new snow, the training camp would have been pretty bad because they didn't have much snow. Yeah. And so that two feet kind of just covered all the rocks and like made it uh, like work out better. And then, yeah. and then it was sunny and free stock conditions for like the next two weeks. So by the, by the end, by the, at the beginning of the camp, it was like forgiving easy winter snow to get back into skiing, to get like, uh, the rust off, you know, cause mm-hmm. after being in flip-flops all summer and it takes t- like, if you jumped right onto ice, it'd be 
a little bit intense. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So like it was yeah. the perfect progression from like softer snow. And then by the end it was, it was like rock hard, full length downhill super G. Um, awesome. Great training. So, yeah. so is it La Parva or, or Portillo or, or where are you guys at? Yeah. The, the first trip uh, was in La Parva, uh, oh, cool. which is like just up uh, above Santiago. There's like 5 million people down in the Valley below. Yeah. And then it's just like up above there. Um, and then this next trip, we're going to Portillo, which is like nice. one of the most iconic summer ski destinations on the planet yeah I've, I've been there twice never La Parva but uh was yeah. down there and um was in actually in uh Portillo right before the 2006 Olympics okay. and the national team was down there I was down with another skier friend who blew out his knee and we were just skiing it wasn't a training trip we just wanted to get yeah. some ski time in but the, the national team was there in 2006 right before the, yeah it I was when I was before the Torino yeah. Olympics yeah I don't think you were I there I think I, I would have remembered if you were there yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I think, I mean, I don't know if you were on that, you were probably not on the A team by that point. No, 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 no. Yeah. I think this was just a team. I remember, I mean, you know, like classic, like, uh, you know, it was the Bodie, you know, Bodie era, yeah. um, which is so cool down there. Cause like Portillo, as you know, it's kind of like a small cruise ship, just like, there's nowhere to go. You know, you, everybody's yeah. there and there's a couple of lifts and, uh, I mean, it's just like, yeah, from that lake and from the pool, it's just like, you I know, know. six, 6,000 feet up on both you know, both sizes, man, I want to go back there so badly. I'm jealous. Yeah. That's, uh, that's yeah, I mean, cool. we, so with COVID, uh, Chile was closed for travel for the last two or two or three years now. And yeah. then like the year or two before that, they had really bad winters. So we haven't been to Portillo in like five years now, which is that's crazy wild. because it's, yeah. it's like my favorite place to train, probably the best training in the world. And like you said, so cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so finally, I mean, the snow's melting really fast, but yeah. they should have enough um for us to go down there on friday for two more weeks sweet um, yeah right on man well um yeah let's just kind of jump into it i was wondering i mean i know we're, we're uh you know we're a year apart for for listeners I was, i'm an 87 travis is an 88 but um what like when did you get started skiing were, were you like a two three years old just right away or a little later where did it start i know palisades was your at squaw valley formerly it was your home mountain right yeah yeah so, so i start I, um, I was born in Truckee, California, and my parents had a house in Alpine Meadows, which is right mm -hmm. on the backside of like KT22 and Squaw mm -hmm. Valley now, Palisades, Tahoe. Yeah. So like literally right out my back door, um, I could like climb, climb up the backyard and ski in the backyard and yeah. just like living in the mountains. And, and, uh, my, my two older sisters were both ski racers. Mm -hmm. And then I have a twin, a twin brother. Not that many people know that I have a twin brother. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like our, so our whole family was just really, really into skiing. Did and he start skiing at all? Or did he, yeah, did yeah. he ski race? Yeah. So we both, both my brother and I started ski, skiing when we were like one and a half, two years mm -hmm. old, mm -hmm. um, just kind of in the, in the backyard and then over at Squaw Valley now Palisades and, and then yeah. progressed from there to like the Mighty Might program and then to the Squaw Valley ski team. And then, and then kind of after that, he, he went into like, my brother went into like music and, and uh, um, cross country skiing. And I went mm -hmm. into I, I, I stuck more with uh, ski racing and then that's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. But then way before that, my, uh, so my parents met on the UC Santa Barbara ski team, <laughs> which was kind of funny. Like just, it's more of like a ski club, but they yeah, right. Ski. Like this, like the Stanford ski team or something like exactly, that. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. Super fun. Just like they get to go up into the mountains and All right. uh, have some fun. And yeah, anyways, yeah. they met skiing there. And then even before that, my, uh, my grandfather, he grew up in Southern California and he as a kid was staring up at Mount Baldy, which is this big peak above LA. And mm -hmm. he built himself uh, skis and wood shop, wooden skis uh, and climbed up the mountain and taught himself how to ski like back before people were really doing that. So, yeah. so that was kind of where it all started. And then, and then he fell in love with my grandpa fell in love with skiing and then he built a cabin in mammoth. So my dad grew up going to mammoth as a kid skiing mm -hmm. there. And then the rest is history. Just kind of, my dad is a doctor. So he, um, when he was done with school, he, he was choosing a place to go start working. And for him, it had to be a place in the mountains with snow and yeah, that, sure. land, that landed us here in Tahoe, which is yeah. like the perfect place for me to, to grow up. And then, yeah. and then all those opportunities since then kind of just unfolded. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause you mentioned you have a twin brother and just, it's, it's a, obviously a classic example of like, I guess, sort of nature nurture, but like, you know, you guys have very much the same DNA of the same parents. You have the same upbringing yet you decided, I mean, you were obviously pulled towards Alpine skiing and towards like that probably thrill seeker sort of thing. And then, and to become a downhiller and, and, uh, it's just, I don't know. I just find that really interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, we're like polar opposites, my brother. And really? I, like, yeah, like we're wow. uh, we're twins, and but like yeah. just from, from day one, um, kind of polar opposites. Like, I was always just trying to like go outside and adventure in the yard. Art and and he he would be happy just sitting in his room like making models of like of like spaceships and things and like playing video games and cool. and he he was yeah we just very different interests um, yeah for sure we both we both like ski we both played music we both yeah. cross country ski we both like did a bunch of the th- similar things but then once we got older we for sure like went our own paths and right and yeah we both we both have found success in our our own way so. yeah yeah I mean, would you say that right from the beginning you you had like that you were super passionate about alpine skiing and, and i mean how did how did the racing thing come into into the picture i actually was talking briefly to to shane and nick before this because um i just wanted to know if there was anything specific i should ask you but they were they both mentioned that you had this like or this was actually shane who said you just had this attitude that was almost sort of like silly like it could be raining or <laughs> just the, the most obnoxious like objectively terrible conditions and you know, you would always come into it with this attitude of like, oh my God, that was the best day skiing ever. Like, I mean, is that something you cultivated or did you just kind of come out like that? Um, I, I never remember skiing ever being like hard or, or like uncomfortable or like any, any part of it being like, uh, forced, forced at all. Like I just absolutely <laughs> loved it. Like yeah. from day one. And I, I was watching some videos of when I was really, really little skiing and like, just from then, then until now, like nothing's really changed. I, I love it for the same reasons. And it's, and like the feeling I have in the snow and, and like, as a kid, I would literally wake up pouring rain outside and I would wake up early in the morning and go wake my parents up and force them to drive me to the ski area to go ski. Cause That's like, amazing. I wanted to be out there and just in the elements. And the, yeah, I, mm-hmm. I love, I love like every single part of it still to this day. Um, yeah. and people probably think I'm a little crazy because I do like enjoy. Well, you, you are, you are a little crazy. I mean, to, yeah. to be a world cup downhill or like, you need to just be a little bit off. You, you yeah. do so. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that part, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other downhillers in the world that have similar mm-hmm. skills, but like none of them love skiing as much as I do. Like I, I awesome. thrive in that environment. I love yeah. the mountains. I love it when it's raining. I love it when it's sunny. I love it when it's like ice hard. I love, I love powder, like, like yeah. all the different elements that are constantly changing is what keeps it interesting. And so yeah. that's like, for me, why I'll never grow tired of it. It's just such yeah. a fun thing to do. Yeah. Which is a huge advantage though. I would say on the world cup and just in life, because if you can basically reframe any sort of situation um, to be something that you're excited about, I mean, that's like, especially in ski racing where we're not talking about basketball where it's, you know, 68 <laughs> degrees. I mean, Hey, basketball is an incredible sport, but you get the point is that I couldn't the imagine, elements, it's just always yeah. different. And yeah, no, I couldn't imagine like being a swimmer and showing up to the pool every day and like, doing lap yeah. after lap after lap and just I, the monotony yeah. would drive me crazy so for me like being able to travel all over the world to different mountain ranges and different yeah. cultures and meet like-minded people who like grew up in the mountains and love to ski and then share those experiences and then also like the weather and the different snow and and the yeah. different trees and just like it's it's constantly changing and it's constantly a challenge like I'm never going to perfect skiing yeah. but I'll, but I, I'll keep trying and it's, right. it's super fun yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you remember, I think this was 2002 or 2003. I'm just thinking about it now because uh, just it was terrible weather. There was a downhill in Super G camp and I know you were on and it was one of the like junior Olympic or NDS camps and we were in Norway. Yeah. And it basically rained. I don't remember <laughs> what the resort was, but it basically it was at, rained. No, yeah. Yeah. It Where was, was it? The, the Folgafona. That's right. That's right. That's yeah, right. It, it just, basically rained like every single time. Yeah, it's on the west coast of Norway, like in the yeah. fjords, just across yeah. the fjord from Bergen, which is like mm-hmm. a big city there. And yeah, I, I was christened we, in Bergen. My parents yeah. were both born there. So really? Yep. Oh, no yeah. way. That's um, crazy. Uh, I'm yeah. Like, as Anderson. Norwegian as you could be. Anderson. Yeah, SEM. And, yeah, there you are. Yeah. No. So uh, I remember that camp so, so vividly because yeah, mm-hmm. it would just, it just poured rain every day. And we had like fish paste soup or something. And like, <laughs> I don't know, just these pretty Scandinavian like meals. And we were all staying yep. in that little like farmhouse kind of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, that, it, I had a good time still. I mean, it was. Oh, it was me pouring, too. Yeah. It was pouring <laughs> rain and like foggy. And like we were trying to do gliding up on the glacier. And yeah. Yeah. Th- those were those uh, camps as a kid were pretty cool, actually, to like learn about life and and like just for learn sure. about all sorts of new things that that you are not normal for kids that age to experience, you know? Was- Absolutely. And I, I think to, you know, even take it further, it's like, it's hard to blame kids at that age for not fully appreciating it because you, you, you just don't know how lucky you are. But again, even to go there and, you know, have maybe 
conditions that aren't necessarily ideal or whatever. And obviously, you know, you have the perspective, which everybody should try to adopt. It's like, you know, make the best of it, but just those experiences that a lot of us had were, were, uh, incredible. And as I've gotten back into coaching and, and actually ski racing a little bit, like anytime I can try to impart that on some younger athletes and it, it you, you kind of have to be gentle with it because you don't yeah. want to like make people feel guilty about how, yeah. you know, how awesome they have it. But it, I just, this is something I really noticed over the last three or four years. It's just kind of looking back at those times and be like, holy shit, that was really, <laughs> that was really incredible. You know? I mean, also though, like, like being uh, a little bit unaware of how lucky you are and like, mm -hmm. like, not, like it's, there's kind of like something magical about that too, because That's you're true, yeah. living in the moment and you're like, just kind of doing it, you know, and it doesn't and feel heavy. Yeah. It doesn't feel heavy. It's just fun. It's new. It's, it's, it's exciting. And you're just like, but then at the same time, yeah, like I, I think I was even back then I was aware of like how cool and special it was. And, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it's hard to have that perspective when you're that young. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a, that was a fun trip. That was yeah. a long time ago. <laughs> no, yeah. 20 years ago. And I'm Crazy. still doing the same exact thing, which is, which insane. is amazing, man. Yeah. It's really amazing. Uh, and I mean, you're the, I think you're the last one left that's kind of of my generation, right? I mean, I know Nyman's yeah. even quite a bit older than you are, but like for, yeah. for our age skiers, I think you're, you're it, right? Yeah. There's so, yeah, in this country, well, almost in the world. So there's, uh, there's Mario Cavietzel. He's in 88. Yeah. So, so the two of us are the only two 88s in the world. They're still skiing. Just and think man. how good you'll be when you're Johan Clary's age. <laughs> yeah, there's nobody even close to his age. Well, Steve. That is wild, man. Steve is close to his age. Steve is, I think Steve's 40, going to turn 41 soon. Yeah. I'm only 34. So, I mean, looking at yeah, those. That's guys, nothing, man. I'm like, wow, okay, I could I could do this for longer. But <laughs> I have to say, when I saw back-to-back -back years, Johan Clary. Is it Clary or Clary? Or, uh, I mean, Cla Clary. Clary. Yeah, uh, Johan yeah. Clary. Yeah, uh, getting second at the Hanukkah two years in a row. It was like part of me, like my heart kind of broke that he like didn't win. But yeah. that is just so impressive, like across all sports. It's, I mean, it's just absolutely amazing to go to like basically arguably the hardest venue in the hardest discipline. And just it's, you know, the, the mental, physical components and to be the yeah. oldest guy by far and to actually like land on the podium. It's yeah. like, OK, man, you're impressive. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's really cool to see that. I mean, I think like. 20 years ago, that would have not been possible, but now right in age with like the sports science and the yeah. way we're training and like the doctors and yeah, just all of that stuff. Like everyone's staying healthier for longer and, and like everyone is training much more professionally. Like it's very right. different than it used to be. Um, even in my career, I've noticed it, but like you look back at like Bodie and Darren and those guys, like, like what yeah. they were doing compared to what we're doing now is, is night and day. And like, you, so what do you mean by that? Do you mean uh, like this, the, the science and the professionalism of the training or what? everything so like so yeah so so the, all of that stuff for sure like there's much more um scientific training methods being used like more, more skiing specific yeah uh dryland training in the summer and yeah and, and more like um like resting better and training harder when it's appropriate mm -hmm. and like yeah just managing managing the load but then also the equipment like the equipment has gotten so much better right and and the snow surface we're skiing on has gotten so much better and the speeds have gotten so much higher and so all of those things like actually need you to be much more stronger and much yeah. more powerful athlete. Yeah. Yeah. I think, right. I think now like that, like the top level of the sport, all the athletes are such crazy physical specimens. Now you have yeah. to be yeah. And back in the day. You could it's amazing. You could kind of have a more relaxing summer and, and show up and be competitive. And nowadays you can't be like, you have to like, yeah, year round, like be fully dedicated to it and working your ass off. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember seeing <laughs> clips of Alberto Tomba like having a cigarette in his <laughs> mouth or something like that. And I'm like, the guy's got to know that that's not an advantage, but he's probably down there. And he's just like, you know what? I'm such a badass, and I know this is bad for me. I'm gonna win the World Cup and I'm gonna smoke. I mean, this is like 1997, but you know. Anyway. I mean, imagine, <laughs> imagine like like ski racing is such a mental sport. And yeah. so like, like the mental edge that he got over the rest yeah. of the field by him, like standing on the top of the mountain, smoking <laughs> yeah. a cigarette. He like, probably wasn't inhaling, man. He's like, <laughs> yeah. Knowing that, knowing that he's like, has the skills yeah. to do it. And then, and then he goes and does it. And like, everyone else is looking at him like, look at this guy. Like, like it, yeah. I don't know. I think, I think there's a lot to be said for like finding that little mental edge against your uh, comp uh, yeah. competitors. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So speaking of just how the sport has changed and like tech, technical, tactical aspects, um, I mean, this this part of the sport has always been so interesting to me. And I'm, I guess I'm just kind of wondering, it's kind of a broad question, but, you know, if you think about tactical elements, technical elements, 
um, physical training, mental, maybe spiritual. I'm not exactly sure kind of what you're into that way, but like, how do you think about those components to the sport? And I guess maybe what are some, what are, what are some ways you think about each of those elements? And when you approach ski racing, you approach downhill, are you thinking about it um, kind of more from an a- analytical perspective or are, are you kind of skiing more from, from feel? I mean, I know it's not necessarily one or the other, but if you can just speak yeah. to some of that stuff, I mean, just personally very interested. Yeah, no, I mean, it's such a complicated sport and there's so many things that have to align on race day to make it all come together, to make it all happen. So you mm-hmm. can't just rely on like being super strong. You can't just rely mm-hmm. on your skis being fast. You can't rely on like uh, the weather, your the, what you start, the bib number, like all these things. Yeah. It's it's a combination of everything. And so for me, I, I try to like segment all those things into mm-hmm. like manageable parts. So, yeah. so like in the summer, I, I don't really think about skiing at all, I, but I, I am hundred percent focusing on like getting as strong as possible and, and being as healthy as possible so that I can manage the load. And then once I know I've done that work, I just like, forget about it. I, I like, it's like check mark, check done, move on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like at a race, it's, it's more just me ha- trying to keep it light and, and not take it too seriously and have fun with it. And all, and also like, make sure that like all the little things are taken care of before I push out of the start mm-hmm. gate so that I yeah. don't have to like think about anything. Right. Um, like the prep and, is either done or it's not when yeah, you're and, in the gate. And, and if you, and if you do all the prep and you have a plan before you get to the gate, right. it's really easy just to like turn your brain off and react and pull out amazing performances, find like your flow, like get, right. into, the, get into the zone, you know? Yeah. But, it, but th- at the same time, the sport is so dangerous. It's so physically demanding. It's so, the, the margins are so tight that if you, if you don't take care of all those little things and you show up to the start with a little doubt in your head, the, game, the, the race is over, you know, like you'd have no chance. Not only is the race over with downhill and super general world coming, I mean, that's like negligent. If you yeah. can't, if you can't show yeah. up, you know, yeah. with a game face, you shouldn't be doing it. But it will, but it's really, really hard because like, there are so many things that you need to take care of. Like, like ski racing is insane. It's, it's yeah. such a difficult sport. Like you're in downhill or we're going down seven, eight kilometer long tracks. It's two and a half minutes long. And you're fighting for hundreds of a second. Like the difference mm-hmm. between winning the race and getting 10th could be three tenths of a second. It's nothing. Yeah. So like, yeah. I mean, all those little things, Yeah. it takes a lot of time to, to learn what's important and how much energy to put into each part of the sport to get right. the best result. And I think that's why like guys like Johan Claret and myself and other veterans who've been doing downhill for a long time, it, it becomes a lot easier actually yeah. because you, you know, exactly yeah. what you need to do to get a result like yeah when you're younger you just try to push as hard as you can and hope for the best right but, but looking back at all those days like you end up wasting so much energy on things that aren't really that valuable yeah and so over time you learn how to balance everything out to like take care of all the things in the right order and the right mm-hmm. with the right amount of energy so that you right. have best performance it's 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 super i guess yeah to answer your question more specifically i'm very analytical when it comes to how i ski race yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, which is but up until I, until I start until I've got it. Yeah. Gate. Yeah. But then once I push out of the gate, it's only feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And I normally have like one or two little mental cues that, that I remind myself of. So like, whether it be like, keep my chest down or like, yeah. or like I, I, norm, I literally just have one thing I normally try to tell myself while I'm skiing or, or nothing at all. Yeah. Um, and the best runs are those runs where I like, just react. And ideally that cue is something that is enough to set up the rest of anything else. It's like one thing that gets you, yeah. that makes it all the, uh, the rest yeah. of the, the components fall into place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like technically and tactically, like everybody's at a super high level, physically, everyone's at a super high level too. Yeah. Um, but then just knowing like when to push and when to hold back and, and, and what sections like are, are your sections, like what, 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 what is your strength and weakness and how to like right. maximize those things, um, and show up so all that stuff taken care of. And so for me to like really see, well, I just have a couple mm-hmm. little mental cues that I, I try to keep it simple. And I like, yeah. I find on the, on some of my best runs, this, this last camp from training, I found that I was like, after each, like maybe 10 or so gates, I would kind of mm-hmm. like remind myself of what I would like, I would be like, like tell myself, like, keep my chest down, like, or like right. do this. or like, I, and, and, and that was really cool to like mentally reset, like halfway down the runs. Cause because sometimes when you're ski racing, you're going 80 miles an hour and, and it's, everything's are happening fast and you, you, yeah. you forget to think you forget to like mm-hmm. keep working on stuff as you're going down the hill. And, and it's, it's, I don't know. I, that's something I've, I've, I'm learning to do more of like, like little, little key reminders to like, keep doing what I'm trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The way that I'm kind of seeing it, certainly with your career, but again, like 
speaking about guys like, uh, you know, Johan Clary and, and, um, but even going into other sports, I mean, Tom Brady's a great example of it too. It's like, if you're paying attention, not just in athletics, but just as a human being on this planet, like you should be acquiring more knowledge and more wisdom. And as an athlete, like, as long as you can like maintain your physical level, you're mentioning before, like how sports science is advanced and stuff like that. I think part of like what happened years ago as well was that mentally people just thought, well, you, well, by the time you're 30 years old, you can't be a professional athlete anymore. And so if that's where you're starting from, you're not doing it. And now people are proving that to be wrong left and right. Oh, yeah. Um, oh yeah. No, I mean, there's so much to be said for, for the experience you gain. Like by the time you hit 30 in a professional sport, that experience, if you had that experience when you were 20, you would be the best in the world. For sure. Um, right. Yeah. But, but then there's like, yeah, like the inverse curve of like your, your health and, and your motivation and injury prevention, things. injury <laughs> prevention. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's interesting to see now how like that curve is changing a bit and, and it's elongating for sure. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And they still see like these Norwegian kids, like, uh, Adley Lee McGrath and Lucas Broth. And I mean, there's, they're, you know, 20 years old, they're winning world cups, but then you see guys all the way till 40 years old that are competitive, yeah. which I actually think is exciting for the sport. It's just kind of broadening the range of like yeah. where, where you can actually do all. I'm curious, um, speaking personally to like your experience, how would you rate your own fitness now? compared to throughout your career and maybe in various ways, like, um, you, you I mean, obviously strength would be one, but also just, you know, how quickly you're able to move and maybe flexibility, endurance. And then also like, what does your training actually look like right now? Are you in a certain phase? Are you trying to gain more muscle? Are you trying to, are you trying to get faster? I mean, what are you doing right now? And God, I just threw a whole shit ton at you, <laughs> but I'm going to throw even one more at you, like periodization. Like, so here we are in September, yeah. you got to race, Two months until downhill, right? Lake no, Louise? this this year we have an early season race in Zermatt in Switzerland in October, end of October. So, so but they've always had Solden for. But yeah, is this, but a, we have is a, this downhill. a downhill? Yeah, we have oh two shit, down- and that's brand new. Yeah, brand new, and it and it's it may or may not happen. It depends on if okay. the glaciers start getting more winter like soon. Okay, <laughs> they're pretty they're melting fast this summer. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, to, to hit back on some of those questions, I think when I was younger, growing up on the Squaw Valley ski team, mm-hmm. we didn't really focus at all on like the conditioning side of things. We, we just skied and we like mountain biked and had fun in the summer and we were kids. It was mm-hmm. perfect. It's exactly what kids should be doing at that age. And, and, and it's really t- tough seeing how the youth in ski racing now is, is losing that. And they're just getting super hy- hyper-focused and training mm-hmm. like we do at a young age. It's, it's crazy. Anyways, long story short, I, I didn't do that until I made the team. And then once I made mm-hmm. the ski team, I learned. Which how to, was when, like 18, 17? Uh, 15 and a half, 16 years old. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's a I development really, team. Yeah, I was. Yeah, D team years. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's when I first was introduced to like summer training and gym training. And, mm-hmm. and I did not like it. I was not into it. Like for me, like the summers were all about like backpacking and, and climbing mountains and biking and just be going on adventures and being a kid, you know? And, mm-hmm. and those are things that made me a good athlete and like got me fit in certain ways, but, but they didn't, they weren't specific for down, being a downhiller. And back then I was, I was playing soccer. I was like super fast, quick running kid, you know, like pretty scrawny, pretty small. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a really, I was a very talented skier. So like mm-hmm. I, I got away with, with skiing pretty fast without having to like train to be a skier. I was doing all sorts of sports. I was a very like well-rounded athlete, mm-hmm. but then once I, I, I think I was on the C team or the B team at that time. And, and there was one season where all of a sudden, like I, I took a step back backwards. Mm-hmm. I, my results kind of suffered and, and I was like, kind of, I didn't really know what was going on. And so then I, I that's the summer where I was like, all right, I made a, made the, the decision to like fully dedicate to doing a summer of dryland training and see what would happen. And was and, that like a, like a crisis moment for you where you're like, oh shit, I yeah. might not actually be like living my dream here if I don't get my act together. Yeah. Well, so it was, it was a lot more than just that. I was on vocal. I skied on vocal as a kid yeah. and, and I, I kind of outgrew their products. I was like the best kid in the world doing mm-hmm. downhill and super G on vocal, which doesn't say a lot. I, was, I think I was ranked like 180th in the world or 150th in the world. And, and just to be the best on a brand, I'd be at, ranked that like there was not much room for growth. Right, at all. Yeah. I was, I hit, I was struggling. So like that year combination of like, yeah, just relying on my talent and, and not like my work ethic and mm-hmm. the equipment, like I definitely took a step back and it was crisis mode. So, so that's that spring. I, I uh, did spring series on Eric Fisher's atomic skis and like got some better results. Uh-huh. And, and I, I was kicked off the team for a short period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyways, long story short, I, I like committed fully that summer to training hard in the gym. 
mm-hmm. and 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 the, the team Sasha Rierich told me like okay if you go down to New Zealand and you do the Australia New Zealand Cup races and you get results like we're gonna get you back on the team or something he like gave me an ultimatum mm-hmm. so yeah anyways with that that crisis mode engaged I was like all right I I like I have a talent for ski racing I know I want to do this like I want to see what what where this leads I don't want to just give up like I, I have to I have to really see how, like how hard I can work and where it'll take me. So mm-hmm. I showed I showed up to New Zealand after training a whole summer and was just skiing way faster. Yeah. Uh, I, I switched to Atomic. I was on new skis and ended up winning a bunch of races down there and then got invited to ski with the team again. Were these uh, South American was, cups or what? No, they're Australia New Zealand cup races. Oh, okay. So GM and super G races at wow. Mount Hutt and okay. Coronet peak. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and and I started seeing really good again, and and saw the the benefits that that it, uh, summer training in the gym gave me, right? And and so they invited me to the Copper Camp with the the World Cup speed team, and I was winning all the runs. So then they invited me to the the Lake Louise World Cup. I wasn't even on the team really at that point. Um, and like my first training run, I think I got eleventh. And mm-hmm. so like that that year with the switch to the equipment, but also with like fully dedicating to summer training, I think I dropped my world ranking from. 160th 180th to 24th in the world that year wow. and and I, I think that just shows like i had the talent all along but i i relied on it for way too long and mm-hmm. my work ethic wasn't really there and so it took mm-hmm. crisis mode for me to like really dedicate myself to the sport and like push harder and do all the things i needed to do mm-hmm. to be a professional athlete and then i yeah. through that i learned how to be a professional and now I've been on the World Cup for 12 years, 11 years. And yeah, it's been it's been awesome. So, so was that around the time or because when I was preparing for this uh, conversation, I found somewhere, I don't remember exactly where it was, that that your fiance who's also a World Cup. She's a Canadian World Cupper by the name yeah. of G- Gagnon instead of, or how do you pronounce her last yeah. name? That is just Gagnon. a, tri- that is a tri- 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 trivia yeah. thing um, yeah. that she had kind of a profound impact on you. I think you were quoted as saying something like you, she, she helped you see it more as a professional pursuit. Is that, can you expound on that? Yeah. hundred percent. So yeah, I was this kid from, from California, love mm-hmm. free skiing. Uh, that was kind of the culture I grew up with. She was from uh, Quebec from the East coast of Canada. Mm-hmm. And she grew up in a very regimented like program in Quebec where they had dryland training coaches and, and mm-hmm. they, they lifted weights from when they were really young and it wasn't they squab have, alley. <laughs> wasn't squab alley. They, didn't, they didn't have like powder skiing and free skiing yeah. and, and they didn't have the same kind of passion for skiing that I grew up with, but they, mm-hmm. they had rock hard ice conditions and like a really high level racing culture. Mm-hmm. And so when we met, it, we were polar opposites. I was just kind of like the, whatever, <laughs> the, the dude from California and she was the East coast here. And so we, I, I learned like one summer we moved in together, we, were, we started living together and she, every day was waking up and going to the gym. And I was like, I was like, I, well, what do you, why are you going to the gym so much? Like, let's go hang out at the beach. Let's go mountain bike. Let's go do fun things. And yeah, so right. slowly I was, I started joining her at the gym and, and kind of learning from her. Yeah. And that, that kind of coincided with like that year that I, I had a tough season and yeah. So I learned how to train from her and and like the work ethic and like how much you needed to do to be successful. And so now, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like that's, I I actually love the gym now. I love the training. I love how I feel in the summer. And right now as a 34 year old athlete, I'm in the best shape of my whole career. It's crazy. I've, I've I've had knee knee injuries. I've hurt my, my, I've had tons of injuries, you know, and, and at this point in my career to be as healthy and as strong as I've ever been, it's pretty cool. It's, it's that a great, is awesome. great feeling. Yeah. Yeah. We'll keep it going, man. There's uh, so many, so many of us cheering for you. So what is your, what is your uh, conditioning actually look like then? Like what's a, you know, what's a, give me like a week of like, yeah. And you know, this is what my workouts look like. Yeah. So we normally start training. So, so yeah, my trainer, he works for Altus, which is this company based out of Phoenix mm-hmm. and they train like football players and track stars mm-hmm. and professional sports teams. And, and years ago, they opened up this new training center in South Lake Tahoe for mm. high altitude training. And so, um, before the South Korea Olympics, eight years ago, I blew my knee out. Um, and then did my rehab with the guys down in South Lake Tahoe and then, and met Nick Ward, who's this British guy. Um, and ever since then we've been training together. He's been my trainer. I've heard about him. I want to get him on this podcast. Oh, Nick is, Nick is unreal. He's, he is, I trained with him this morning over at Palisades. He's unreal. Like he, he has such a good eye for, for training and, yeah. When we met, he knew nothing about skiing or ski racing. And okay. in the last eight years, like 
he has, he's gotten his masters and pretty more or less in like ski racing training and just from, just from working with me mm -hmm. and, and Marie Michelle. Um, and so, yeah, we, I rely on him for everything. And, and I, I credit a lot of my, my success to him these last years. I mean, he's mm -hmm. changed how I move and, and changed how I train and added impact back into my training routines. And what do you mean impact? Really, like, 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 give me an example of that. So, yeah. So like when we were, when we were younger, when I was younger training and I had like knee injuries over time, like um, the training we did, like it avoided impacts for my knees to, to like okay. keep them to feel, keep them feeling better. Um, and, and it was really focused on getting as strong as possible in the gym. Mm -hmm. Um, not really like focusing on moving well, you know, okay. not, not, not focusing on moving well and like how each part of the body reacts to the other part of the body and how, if everything is lined up properly, it works better. Right. So, so anyways, full 360 degrees, when I started working with Nick, he totally changed how I walk, how I move how all my muscles even how you walk huh like he would watch how you walk and he oh yeah would be, oh yeah no i mean wow. everything starts from your big toe and then goes up your whole kinetic chain into your back yeah. hips glutes knees everything it's all it's all alignment so yeah um re relearning how to move properly took off all this load from my body and then reintroducing impact like helped all the little fibers and tendons and everything strengthen in my body so we talk yeah. like box jumps and jump squats and stuff. Like what's like, what would be an example of an exercise you're doing for impact training? Yeah. As, as simple as just little rudiment hops where you're just doing like three, four inch hops. And, and, but then instead of like a lot of people think about landing really soft and absorbing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for us, it was more about like landing flat footed and really like adding the impact into the training. And so, and that, and that's also an amazing way to build power. You, you can build power off of impact. You know, you, huh. you don't have to like, lift crazy weight to build power you can do it through gra using gravity and so yeah um kind of built back up with that whole mindset to the point now where i'm lifting more weight than i've ever lifted in my life and and feeling like super powerful super explosive yeah. like doing full-on olympic lifting olympic training and my knees feel amazing so right. it's like so you're getting do you think you're getting some of the actual like brute strength value from the impact type training is 100%. that what you're saying Oh yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, 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 and it's it's more than that. It's it's like all the little fibers and the muscles and tendons and ligaments getting a little bit of like um, shock, almost getting 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 like conditioned to that, and then they and then they adapt and they react. Yeah. And they, they they become more healthy. Like yeah, I, I think in the past when we were training, we would always like kind of tiptoe around injuries and just try to keep everything feeling really really good all the time. Yeah, but that that didn't that weakened my body that weakened all these little ligaments and tendons and things to where they would hurt, hurt more. When, when you're ski racing, you put your, your body through intense forces, like G forces and impacts yeah. off jumps. And, and so like, I would be strong, but I wouldn't be um, able to handle those loads and stresses. And so now with my new training, these last eight years, I've built up to a point now where like, I feel unbelievable. And those are the things I wish I knew <laughs> when I was younger, but I think a right. lot of it comes from training with trainers who are more, scientifically with a more scientific approach yeah, for sure. of more experience and they're, they're smarter and and uh but yeah to go back to the training periodization so like we start in the end of may and then normally do like three weeks on one recovery week and with within the three weeks there's normally like a like a building week like a like two building weeks and then like a like a really heavy week and then a recovery week so it's it's kind of three weeks on one week off periodization. Um, now is it totally off or you just mean hiking and spinning and stuff? Like no, that it's not off, off at all. No. So that week off is like, there's still the same kind of, uh, uh, schedule, but the sessions, instead of being like two or three hours long or like one hour long and, and the, the weights off and, and there's a lot more like regeneration sessions. Like you're, you're not just sitting on the couch for a week. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, active recovery weeks. And for ski racing, it's really, you don't have that, that much time to get in that bulk of the summer training. You have pretty much June and July because then August and September you're training. And then October you have like a little block to maybe get back in the gym, but you're on snow all those other times. So, yeah. so yeah, for us, like end of May, all of June, all of July, it's like, you get like six to eight weeks to really put in the work. And it is, it is a grind. It is, it is, we train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday double sessions every day. So mornings in the gym, afternoons on the bike or trails or whatever. And then Wednesdays are yoga, like active recovery yoga day. And then Sundays are normally like nothing like sleep in, have a good breakfast, like hang out at the beach. So yeah, it's, it's in, in, intense. Like the, and yeah. the gym sessions 
I mean, when I was younger, I, the gym sessions would be like two to three hours. Now I'm getting, I'm, I've, I've, I'm getting them down to like an hour and a half. I'm trying to do a little mm-hmm. less as I get older. Cause I don't, I don't need as much. Right. Um, and then the after- minimum effective dose, right? Like don't oh, yeah. tank your hormones and do it when you can. Right. And, and that's just a matter of, of, of becoming more mature as an athlete and like knowing mm-hmm. what I need to do to perform at the highest level. And it's, it's really cool this summer. So last year before, before the Olympics in Beijing, that's that summer leading into the Olympics, I was super motivated. I like thought I should do like more. Like I was just get like hammering in the gym and I completely burnt out. I got into like the middle of July and was like peaking physically and just like my tank was drained. And so you I mean like, like mentally your tank was drained. Yeah. Or- mentally. And like, just like the, the fatigue, mental fatigue from like the grind. Yeah. But I was like physically peaking in July in the middle of July. And that's like, and the, the February. Race, yeah. February is the, 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 the show, you know? So so this summer, um, the mindset was, okay, let's, let's make the sessions like an hour and a half max, but make them more consistent and do them more often. And right. it's been amazing how like, I haven't had that mental fatigue and I've actually gotten stronger because I've, I've been doing, I've had more consistency in my training instead of like pushing myself to the, to the max every single day till I burn out. Like I've, I've had consistent quality over quantity training and, and. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> Still learning yeah. as a 34 yeah. year old athlete. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. The, the physical conditioning part is something I'm so interested in. Then the next question, which is perfectly tied in though, is about uh, diet nutrition. How specific are you with that stuff? Are you, are you sticking to any sort of specific diet? Are you thinking about calories? I mean, are you trying to put on muscle? Are you trying to maintain body weight? What, what, what of that stuff is relevant to you and what's not? Yeah. So, uh, nutrition for a downhill or <laughs> it's not that big of a deal, really. Like it's not as, it's not like a, an endurance sport or like cross country skiing or, or, or certain sports where we're, we're, we're a gravity sport and we're mm-hmm. a power sport. So for us, it's all about being as most, as powerful as possible and, and, and big, you know, you want to, we want to be big guys. I'm, I'm like mm-hmm. one of the smaller guys on tour and, and I love like, I love mountain biking and ski touring and, and like mm-hmm. crazy long cardio sessions, but I can't, I have to be really careful with all of that because then I burn muscle. Like I, I, I can't be too small. I need to be kind of big, you know? So, mm-hmm. so when it comes to my diet, I more or less try to eat as much as I possibly can all okay. the time. And, and, and are you, are you thinking about macros specifically or is it just whatever you can shove into your face? No, no I mean, I, I definitely try to eat like as healthy as possible. Um, and like, and, and try to like, yeah, try to be really smart with what I eat, but it's just the volume. Like I, I try to eat as yeah. much as I possibly can, just because if I, with, with the intensity of the training, um, and the, and, and the, the downhill gravity specific sport that I'm in, right. you can't really afford to be like a lean, small athlete. Like the, 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 the GS and slalom skiers for sure. They, they probably are on a, a different, uh, diet kind of nutrition right. plan. Yeah. But like, for me, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm like 195 pounds and I'm racing against guys who are like 220. So 230. Right. So I have to, I'm, I'm a small guy. So I have to like really, I, and I don't, I don't try to gain weight, but I, I have to eat a lot to maintain where I'm at. Like I, I don't normally, I would normally be like 180 pound guy. I'm five, five foot 10. Right. I'd be like 180 pounds maybe. Um, so for me to be like 195, 200, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's mainly just the lifting in the gym and the training yeah. super hard combined with eating as much as possible. <laughs> Yeah, I, I uh, remember uh, specifically watching World Cup last year and seeing Beat Fuez. Is that is that how you pronounce his name? I was wondering. Foytes. Beat Foytes. Foytes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's a big boy right there. Well, he's <laughs> not that. He's he's short though. He's like. Oh, is he? Well, I mean, he's he's probably like five he's fairly, nine. He's fairly rotund. <laughs> he's probably like five nine, but he probably weighs like two ten, two fifteen. So that's a yeah. There's a bunch of different body shapes. Like Dominic Paris, yeah. he's probably like. Yeah. Six two two thirty, yeah. and then you have like yeah guys like Foyts who are five nine two ten, yeah. and I'm kind of in the middle, I guess. But yeah. So um, total side note here, but last year at Spring Series, I was talking to uh, Tim Cohey, and somehow uh, we got on the topic of of you. I don't know if we're talking about Olympics or World Cup or whatever, but he had mentioned something and maybe I got the details wrong, but that you had been training some GS recently, or maybe it was within the last couple of years and that you were skiing like really, really fast GS. And so my question for you is like, obviously your focus is in downhill and super G, right? But are you still training GS sort of as like, I don't know if this is still, if this is out of date, but like 
back in the day, they always used to tell us, you know, GS is like the foundation of skiing. So they would have everybody train a lot of GS, even if they weren't maybe competing in it. And uh, is that true for you at all? And also, like, if, if you're actually skiing fast GS, I, mean, I, I, don't, I should have looked this up before, but have you raced any World Cup GS in a while? I haven't raced a GS in years, in like okay. six, seven, eight years, you know? I, yeah. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I, we, we train a lot of GS just mainly because it's a lot easier to set up than a downhill or super G training. Right. Of course. Yeah. So like logistically and finding the right hill and finding the right snow conditions, it's like an easy way to set up training and it's still super relevant to everything else, you know, like right. the solid GS foundation allows you to pull off any turn you want in a world cup down or super G. And so we do a lot of GS. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sorry. We don't do that much GS, but we definitely hit on it every camp a couple of days here and there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've, I'm skiing really good GS. I don't know. It's, it's so, really so what, why wouldn't you, I mean, when you say really good GS, are, would you still get your ass kicked in a world cup? I mean, why probably, would, probably yeah, probably. So, yeah. so when we're training, um, normally the training Hills are like relatively easy yeah. and they're not like a, a gnarly, uh, world like Adelboden. <laughs> it's not, it's not Adelboden, yeah. yeah. Or like, like dog leg at Palisades where they're going to have the world cup for the men this year. Like it's, it's not like a gnarly Hill. It's, it's these easy Hills. And so on those easy yeah. Hills, like, a lot of speed skiers are actually yeah. really fast. Like I, when we were training last year in Zermatt, I was beating all the world cup U S guys and uh, GS guys like river God and those guys. Yeah. And, forward, and, and it was fun. It's super fun. It's super fun. They they get super frustrated. Yeah, I'm sure, man. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure they just love that. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it, but it's not just me. Like there's a couple guys, yeah. a couple of the downhillers who are pretty good at GS. And, yeah. but for, I think for the main thing was last, last couple of years, the atomic, uh, GS ski and plate and binding mm -hmm. is, so much better than anything else out there. Like it, I made a huge, huge step forward in my giant slalom skiing to the point mm -hmm. where I think, I think if I had a really good run, like at a place mm -hmm. like Beaver Creek, I would, I would for sure score world cup points in GS. Mm -hmm. I think I'm skiing that well, but for me to like commit to trying to race that, I think it would, it would take, it would take so much time and energy and it would, and my, my downhill and super G results would probably suffer. So okay. I think for me, like my dream scenario would be, to have a really good early season next year and score. I think you have to have 450 world cup points. Um, and then you can automatically get a spot in giant slalom and they slot you in at 31, bid 31. Okay. So like my dream goal would be to, to get to that point and then race at yeah. home here at Palisades Tahoe next spring in front of the home crowd. That'd be, be awesome. Yeah. Cause I grew up, I grew up training on dog leg and that's like yeah. my home hill. And I know I, I, I mean, I'm a, I, I love GS and I'm, I'm like skiing really good GS. So I think I, yeah. could, I, I would, I would probably like, uh, it'd be interesting to, to see where I stack up, you know, and I think it would surprise some people. Yeah. yeah. I hopped in with the Palisades team a couple of times last year and I, and one of the, well, two of the training sessions were GS at, at, uh, on, on dog leg. And it was an early morning session. And I mean, you know, all this already, but there was no sun yeah. on the, on the hill right. at all. And I remember taking like two runs and I was about ready to just go back to my car and be like, <laughs> this is not worth it. Yeah. I'm going to end up in the hospital. I mean, it's just like super bumpy, flat light, you know, yeah. a steep hill, you know? Yeah. Um, no, that, I mean, that hill is, is why I've, I've had so much success in the world cup. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's pitch black. It's dark. It's bumpy. Mm -hmm. It's steep. There's crazy train changes and like mm -hmm. fall away turns and like bank turns. And, and it's like shitty grooming, <laughs> shitty, shitty grooming. So you gotta <laughs> yeah. be like super balanced and yeah. no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly like what we race in Europe, you know? And yeah. I think that's, that's like a testament to, to grow to all the people that have come out of Palisades Tahoe to make it onto the world cup over the years. Like yeah. all, all the kids who grew up in Colorado or Utah or other places, they're used to skiing on like perfect effortless, easy, grippy winter snow all the time. Mm -hmm. And it lulls you to sleep a bit. It teaches you bad habits. You can yeah. lean in and get away with, with murder on your skis. And, and when all of a sudden, when you get to the real deal conditions, like what we race on, you have no idea what to do. So like, yeah. growing up in 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 tahoe skiing on these like we get yeah we get unbelievable deep powder skiing days but in between that it, it's sunny and it gets warm and there's free spa cycles and yeah. the the conditions get rough so like that but that is why we we excel in the world cup it, we, we it's harder for us like the nor the noram level and like uh races in colorado like th those levels where it's easy conditions soft snow easy snow like a lot or of grippy snow are, right like hero snow yeah hero snow yeah. grippy snow yeah but but if we, if as, as Tahoe skiers, if we can survive those years and get out yeah. of it somewhere and go race on a real deal condition, yeah. I feel like as a, as a region, that's when like our skills really come out. So yeah. that, and, and like racing on training on dog leg is a big part of that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited for the World Cup there, which I'm sure everybody is. It's just awesome to have a World Cup back in this area and just to be so close to home. I'm I'm fully planning on volunteering or helping out however I can. And that just to just to see it to be so cool. Yeah, no, I'm excited for that to be back. I think the the long term plan, I think they have like a a multi-year commitment from from the FIS to do World Cups. And so long term, awesome. they really, really want to get a, a World Cup downhill super G. Uh so where would they even run line. it? Where would they even run it down? They, they have um they have a few hills that are already homologated, ready to go for the women. But for the men, they would have to build a new track. And so I actually I helped them. I sat down with them this spring and, and helped them plan out a couple of new venues that, that fit within all the parameters for World Cup. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then actually go back like six, seven years. I actually designed an Olympic downhill track with the SE group, which is based out of Utah. I designed an Olympic track for the Reno Tahoe Olympic bid which is really which is also a viable option so there's a bunch of options and and they have like the motivation to really see it through and so i think yeah. in the next few years it's going to be really interesting if we can get some speed tracks what, back going here what if what is reno and tahoe is that a is that a current bid that's out for a future olympics or was um, that, that already happened they over the last like 20 years they've been kind of loosely organized to try to bring the games back yeah. And there, there, there's been more momentum and less momentum yeah. over the years. And I yeah. think they still are an organization. And I think they're still loosely kind of having that as a, as a goal one year, one day yeah. to get there. Yeah. Um, and like, I mean, that year when they were really pushing for a bid, they, they hired the SE group and I went out with them mm. for a day and we, cool. we built the downhill track um, on paper. And so, yeah, it, it, yeah, I think they, I, I'm not sure where they stand now, but uh, yeah, maybe one day, I mean, the, the first step, would be to get these world cup races going again and then yeah for sure goes from there but. yeah so beijing olympics last year it seemed as a spectator like a, a very bizarre olympics obviously you had the the covid situation which was massively complicating things i was just wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about your experience at the olympics and certainly the you know the com competitive athletic side the track looked pretty cool downhill and super g track looked pretty cool i don't know if, if that was your experience but it certainly looked like that from tv mm -hmm. yeah no it was a it was a really um odd event in a really yeah. odd place and like the, the 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 feelings there were very different from what we normally experience going to a winter destination to go ski race you know yeah. it was it was really really weird like um fl flying into the beijing airport which is one of the largest airports in the world and having it be completely closed and just a ghost town, nothing there. Um, like hazmat suits and stuff. Yeah. Everyone in hazmat suits and like cameras everywhere. And, and just them just like, I don't know, monitoring everything from afar, kind of feeling like lab rats getting like, kind of, I don't know, pushed through this labyrinth of, of plastic tunnels and things. And just like, Strange. it felt like, it felt like like landing on a different planet, like an mm. alien planet and just being like, uh, um, carted through, like you're in a movie, like through mm -hmm. a, this weird kind of scene anyways, mm -hmm. getting, getting out of the buses from there and then just getting bused up into the mountain village where we were staying and like all the roads being closed and not really seeing any people. And just like, mm -hmm. felt like a, like a, I don't know, the whole, the whole country was just on lockdown. So like there was mm -hmm. nobody out there. We didn't, I didn't see any part of what China really is. I, I still have no idea what China's like. Um, like you're in a hotel the, room and then you get bus to the mountain or like, well, yeah, we, we flew, I mean, we flew in, um, got all, went through all the processing, COVID testing, all these things, and then hopped on buses and were bused straight to the Olympic village, which was at the ski area. Mm -hmm. And the, the buses, like they, they, they sprayed chemicals over everything to like for COVID for, I don't know what kind of chemicals they were, but to the point where you couldn't even really see out the windows, there's this like film of sticky stuff over the seats, the windows, the mirrors, like you couldn't really even see what you, like, where we were, mm -hmm. um, just really bizarre. And then, yeah. And then showing up to the village. Um, I mean, from the outside, it was beautiful. Like the buildings were beautiful. They did a really good job building it, but on closer inspection, like everything was just thrown together really cheaply. Mm -hmm. And like, there was huge plumbing issues and, and it smelled like raw sewage. And it was just, like, it was not a very comfortable, exciting place to, to spend a couple of weeks. Um, mm -hmm. and like, it reminded me of like driving out to like Winnemucca in the middle of the desert in Nevada and like, skiing on the, on the side of some deserty hill out in Winnemucca, you know, it was, except it was like minus 20, minus 30 degrees yeah. every day and fr like freezing cold, like the coldest place I've ever been. 
um, with no, with no snow, no natural snow, just like, and dry. it doesn't usually snow there, does it? Right? No, not at all. They get, yeah. they get like 10, 15 inches a year, annual snow. So weird. Of course yeah. it snowed, it snowed on the day of the GS, didn't it? Yeah. And then they that got like one crazy. of the biggest snowstorms on record then, but, yeah. um, but yeah, the venue itself, like the, the ski area they built is pretty amazing. Like if well, one thing that I would give credit for is like the, the Chinese ability to build stuff, like they're really mm-hmm. good at building infrastructure, like the, the roads, the tunnels, the, the, the chairlifts, like everything, like they, it was built like top of the line. Money was not an issue. Also, yeah. I think like the environmental regulations that we face here in the U S they, they, they don't have the same kind of regulations. So they just kind of build, 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 build and deal with Whatever the consequences later. Yeah. And yeah. so it's, with that mindset though, it's pretty impressive. The things that they built for the games mm-hmm. and, and how like impressive that ski area was that they built from scratch. Um, yeah. And then the Hills itself, I mean, the Hills, the downhill track was like, pretty easy honestly like like i know i've heard from a lot of people um who probably don't normally watch world other world cup races yeah they only watch like the the olympics once every four years and so those types of people hearing from them after the games like they were like oh my god that was a crazy track it looked gnarly it was insane and in reality it was pretty easy it was like more of like a like a noram kind of europa cup level Mm -hmm. track as far as difficulty which made it really difficult to be fast on because everybody was pushing super hard there was no section on the course where you could really like push your limits and pull away from the field. There were, right. and, and there was no place where if you did that, you would have a mistake. So like, right. so like it was a drag race. It was really, really difficult yeah. to be fast on. And, um, but that said, it was really fun. I mean, it's a very fun track. Right. It just wasn't like what we normally race and the, and the snow surface was very forgiving. It was more like grippy Colorado snow instead of like the, the icy bumpy conditions we're used to racing on. Like, like, like Copper Mountain in November, right? Cause it, it hasn't snowed yet and it's just cold and it's exactly. chalky, right? Yeah. It was, it was Copper Mountain. It was the Copper yeah. Mountain Olympic downhill, which is the Copper Mountain downhill where we train every year is very easy. So it's like, yeah, right. it was very, yeah, very easy. And, and, and I mean, also like, yeah, like the women and the men were on the same downhill track. Like, obviously it's, it's really, it's really easy, you know, it's yeah. an easy yeah. hill. Um, so for like the, the Olympics in, in, uh, Milan Cortina, um, they've decided to move the men's downhill away from Cortina and they're going to, they're going to host the men's downhill in Bormio, which is like a, one of the gnarly tracks we normally race on. Right. And the women will be in Cortina. So then with that, with that in mind, they can make the downhills like a, a true Olympic test, you know? Yeah. 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 So just one more question on Beijing. Was it, you said it seemed bizarre, but I mean, did they, were they testing you every day for COVID? Did they, were they controlling what you posted on social media and stuff like that? Were there anything rules you had to follow that way? Um, yeah. So they, we, we had to test every single day. Um, there was like a 24 hour t- testing center in the, like near the food hall in the village. So like on the way to the food hall or back, you would kind of just do that every day and no news was good news. So like, uh, every, every once in a while you'd see like the, the paddy wagon come up and like cart somebody off who had tested positive and they would like, there'd be like 10 people in hazmat suits, like surrounding them, oh my gosh. Like, all their bags packed. And then they would just disappear. They'd go off to some quarantine hotel or I don't know, somewhere. And so you were just like, every day you're just like hoping that they wouldn't come knocking on your door in the middle of the night and, oh my gosh. <laughs> and wake you up. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I mean the, the, the rest of it was just really like, I don't know, there, were, there was no spirit, you know, like, like the, there was the Olympic village and like yeah. everyone was there together, but everyone was just kind of stuck in their own little zone. And, yeah. and there wasn't really good, like spaces for working out or training or like, mm-hmm. like when you're off the hill. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and then up on the hill too, like, it was just kind of, it was just, there, it wasn't very, like the Olympics are supposed to be very special, magical experience. And yeah. it was just like, a, I don't know, there, there, it was missing, it was missing like a theme and direction and like, I don't know context. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it was just sure. we, we just were there and we yeah. did we did it we did a race and we left like it was yeah it didn't really feel very special yeah yeah well I mean that's kind of honestly sadly to say but that's kind of how it seemed from TV coverage too I mean yeah it was just a drag I remember just constantly thinking man for you know people that are experiencing the Olympics as as athletes like you and other people but maybe yeah. for some that were just like this is going to be their only Olympics which is which is bizarre yeah. Super um, bizarre. Cause like, yeah, for me, I love connecting to the place where I am. I, I, yeah. every time I show up to a new place, I love like walking around the town or the village or just exploring yeah. and like getting, a, getting to know like the sense of the place and the people and the culture. And I love yeah. that. I, I feed off of that. And, and here, um, we were in this walled off village with guys with machine guns and cameras everywhere and, and wow. you couldn't leave. You were just stuck mm-hmm. in this little place. 
like I looked on Google earth and I saw that there was a hot spring, like two miles yeah. down the road. And so I was like joking around with people. I'm like, let's break out and go check out this hot spring. Like, let's go, let's go on a little adventure. That'd be some press. You You know, Travis Travis Kanon gets arrested in in China (laughs) at the Olympics for breaking out of the village to go to the hot spring. (laughs) I mean, I I thought about it many, many times and it turned into like like a a joke where I, like a running joke kind of when we were there. I did one day, I I figured out how to like go through this tunnel system and it popped me out on one of the the cat tracks that goes that comes down from the ski area and so i like yeah. hiked up the cat track a little bit and so i got i got some connection with nature but yeah other than that it was just yeah it was it was tough yeah. just being stuck in a little shitty hotel room for two weeks and then going up and skiing a couple of rounds and coming back and being stuck like yeah and as far as like uh internet social media all that um our team was like super stressed about all that before we went right and i think it was just like Americans being Americans and freaking out for no reason because it was there was no issues with anything over there. Like, right? I mean, maybe there are in certain situations. Like, I guess if you're there, there has been. If you're Chinese, yeah. If you're Chinese, if you're Chinese, there's been issues with Chinese like people disappearing, like that tennis player, and yeah. um, But as far as that whole side of it went, like, I mean, at at the beginning they told us to be pretty careful with all that, and so we all got like vpn blockers and and mm-hmm. kind of changed our where we were and just yeah and then after that it was just yeah no, no big deal and i mean our, our team was the only team that was being paranoid about it every other country was just like there was no big deal and they were it's crazy they were, they were like wondering why we were so stressed about all that yeah we're living yeah. in the future man yeah so looking back over the course of your career who would be some of your inspirations yeah. So, so growing up in California, I wasn't really that aware of like the world of ski racing growing up. Mm-hmm. I, I watched a few races here and there on TV. And, and I think the first like actual international race that I watched was probably the Nagano Olympics in 98. Mm-hmm. And I specifically remember Herman Meyer's crazy crash. That was like, me too. That was, that was, that was the spot, you know, that was the one, the one moment that like was etched in my brain as a kid of like, wow, this is, this is the Olympics and this is downhill ski racing. And this looks amazing. This looks so badass. Like I want to do mm-hmm. this. So, so that kind of set the stage. And then, and then here locally, like guys like Darren Rolves, mm-hmm. um, who were all of a sudden beating the Austrians, beating Herman Meyer, like mm-hmm. winning races, kind of paving the way for, for guys like me. And then, and then Marco Sullivan, a couple of years mm-hmm. later, starting to win races and knowing him as a kid and knowing that yeah. he grew up on the squad Valley ski team and, and, and then all of a sudden, bam, I'm there with all those guys on the same yeah. team training and racing with them. So like th- those were really, those guys were really inspirational for me when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once I was on the tour, one guy in particular who really inspired me and who I tried to emulate was Eric Gay from Canada. Mm-hmm. He, um, his style of skiing and his professionalism and, and his touch and, and, and the way he like managed risk and, mm-hmm. and, his, and he was just a beautiful skier. I mean, all of those things. Mm-hmm. really like fit into how I wanted to ski. And so, mm-hmm. and so I think like, I, I loved watching video of him and trying to emulate him. And I think I've, I really ski like him too. So that was like, that was probably the guy who I really looked at for a long time. Awesome, man. Oh, this, I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but I was gonna, I meant to ask you about fitness when you're talking about training to prepare for the season, but like, how about maintaining through the season? Cause you have this huge long world cup season. You talked about, we have a few months to really like get in shape, but what sorts of things do you lean on to just basically make, you know, you're not losing muscle and you're not losing strength and, and um, right. you're not getting worn down. Like what, what sorts of things do you do to, to keep that stuff at bay? Yeah. I mean, that's really difficult because we, when we're training and racing like on snow, that is yeah. so physically demanding that it's really hard to expend any energy in the gym, yeah. you know, lifting weights. And so do you, so do, you say, do it at all? Well, yeah. So I'd say like 90% of, of what we do while we're skiing is all recovery based. So like, like, uh, so going on the spin bike and stretching and doing like core activations and like, mm-hmm. like light little things here and there. And we do that every single day. Um, and then normally like after a race, or if we have like three or four days off, we try to fit in a lift here and there, but there's like, there's probably like only enough time for like two to five of those during the whole season, you know, cause we're, right. we're going from hotel to hotel, traveling all around the world, sitting in planes, sitting in cars, like, like the, the amount of time, I mean, the worst thing you could do is like, go, go through a crazy five day race week in Bormio, like lift a bunch of weight and then sit in the car. And then, it, and then your, your whole body will just lock up and, and you'll, it'll take like five or six days to feel ready to race again. So like, Mm -hmm. honestly, when we're, when we're like in the meat of the season, we're just kind of trying to rest as much as possible and, and, and eat well, stay hydrated, like see the physical therapist, uh, do all of our little, 
like activations and, and kind of rehab type workouts and, and regeneration. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, try to like, I try to like go in the sauna and like really like get my body to relax and get back to neutral. And, mm-hmm. and then, and then, uh, the, one of the main things actually that really primes the system and keeps it fresh is, is like the night before each race, we do a pre-race workout. And normally the pre-race workout, you add in like some power cleans and like jumps and, and more explosive kind of weightlifting stuff. But yeah. it's very like short and it's very specific. It's very brief. It's like a, a 30 minute session and you like spend, I don't know, you spend 25 of those minutes like warming up and getting ready. And then you do like five minutes of like something heavy yeah. and then you, and then your, your system's primed for the next day. So that's, that's kind of the race, the race side of it. Um, right. Yeah. And then the, for us, like the hardest, the hardest time of the year is the summer on snow because then you're doing volume. Then you're doing like mm-hmm. five, six, seven runs a day, mm-hmm. like full length downhill. And then you, you like this last camp in Chile, we skied, uh, we skied 14 out of 15 days. We almost skied every single day in a row. Mm-hmm. And, and we were doing full length downhill super G and we were trying to train in the gym. And it just was like those, those like super intense blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the, those are the physically like the hardest times of the year. And then the race season. Yeah. We're doing like a warm up run an inspection run and a race run. So you're doing like three runs a day and then you're trying to rest as much as possible in between. And yeah. you actually, it's funny. Like I actually, it's hard for me because I love to ski. So it's mm-hmm. so hard for me in the race season because I don't get to ski that much. Right. Like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like doing a few runs a day and I'm trying to rest so that I can, I can perform. So that's why like in the spring, when the spring rolls around, when the season's over, I have like a second winter and I'm so excited. Skiing. Yeah. Right. To right. Ski. Like I come home in the middle of March and then I have like the rest of March, all of April, all of May. If it's a big winter, I can ski into June, like here in Tahoe. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. And I, people think I'm crazy, but that like in the winter, I don't really, honestly, I ski like a lot of days, but yeah. not very many runs, you know? <laughs> well, no, I get it. I mean, if you're, if you're training five, six days a week and then you need a day off, even if you want to go free skiing, if you're oh, no. trying to be a professional in the world cup, like that's yeah. the wrong move. Yeah. And like this window in our careers is like a short window, like the, in our lifetime of skiing. You so, ski the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's worth, it's worth like, like doing it the right way for this window, but for sure being in these beautiful places, like over in Europe or Scandinavia and not being able to go yeah. explore and ski is, is very, very hard. Yeah. <laughs> so have you thought, I mean, I imagine you've probably given some thought to like how long you might try to continue ski racing. Is this something you're taking year by year? Are you thinking about it on an Olympic cycle? Are you trying to beat Johan Clary's record? Like what, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Um, there's, there's no, there's no way in hell I'll be racing when I'm 42 that, that I can tell you that right away. Um, right. but yeah, so I think, I think after I quoted after like, you on that, yeah, <laughs> the last, the last two years with COVID was really difficult on the road. We were having to isolate in our rooms, like between, uh, training sessions and racing. And like, we were like uh, to the point where I was like eating dinner alone in a hotel room, like isolating from everyone, like, like, and then testing every single week to go to a race, like. It just, it was super stressful, um, leading into the Olympics. And so like, yeah, with all of that going on, I was like, all right, this is not as fun as it used to be. Like, I'm really looking forward to not doing this pretty soon. And like, Mm -hmm. like going into like big mountain skiing or or trying doing something, other aspects of skiing that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was kind of where I was at at the end of this season, uh, not really ready to retire, but getting really close to like being ready. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I took a break. I, I like, decided not to go to the, the spring camp in Norway or the one in mammoth. And so from like world cup finals, which was done March 15th until, uh, August 7th this year, I didn't ski race. I didn't touch one gate. I didn't mm-hmm. carve one turn on race skis or race boots. I took a break and it was unbelievable. It was so mm-hmm. nice. Like the first time in my 17 years on the team where I didn't train on snow in the off mm-hmm. season. And, uh, so yeah, it was, it was amazing. It gave me like a, an actual break and I got a lot of clarity on like what I wanted. And, and I realized that I, I definitely have more that I want to accomplish in the sport mm-hmm. and it, and it like relit my fire and like made me hungry again. That's awesome. And I, man. and I showed up to this first camp in Chile, like absolutely firing on all cylinders and, mm-hmm. and being super grateful for being able to do this and having a different perspective. And which led me to like skiing faster than I've ever skied in my life. This That's great. Camp after not skiing and people like, like we were training with the German guys and I was telling Roma Dauman, one of the Germans, he mm-hmm. used to be Austrian. I was telling him like about how I hadn't skied since world cup finals. And he was pissing them off. Cause like, I was, I was like winning all the runs at the trade, like on the training that day. And they're like, what? Yeah. Like you didn't ski for 
four months, five months and you're winning like this. And yeah. they're, so, they're like frustrated, but like, honestly, there's so much to be said for, for being fresh and like having breaks and like coming back mm -hmm. and being excited to go. And for so, sure. yeah, the, the rest of my career, I'm never going to ski like in the, in the spring or summer. Um, I'm going to take breaks from, from being a ski racer and that, that might extend my career quite long actually. Yeah. But, but that said, like, there's so many things I want to do in life other than ski racing. Yeah. So I'm not quite taking it year by year, but I think I'm taking it every two years. Two, it's, two you, by two. You're, you're in the final couple chapters, though. You know that. Oh yeah. No yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. Like like this year, next year. I mean, the longest I would keep going would, would be uh, the Cortina Olympics or the the Milan Milan Olympics. But yeah. in all in all honesty, if I I think the one thing I really want to do in my career that I haven't done was is uh, get a podium at Kitzbühel, mm -hmm. and so yeah, if I get there and I get that accomplished, and I think like then I'll, I'll have had one world cup downhills, had a world, world championship medals, podium in super G on the world cup. Um, I think I've had like almost 50 top tens on the world cup. So I think mm -hmm. like, like looking back at all that, like, like the podium at Kitzbühel, I think I'd be pretty stoked to move on after that. So we'll yeah, see. that's cool. That's and my then, goal. Yeah. So basically my last question is just like outside of ski racing. I mean, obviously this is it's going to end at some point. I actually just ordered some uh, Pacific Crest coffee, which I understand nice. is your company, right? Or you're a co-founder yeah. in. So like, I mean, yeah. what, what do you, what do you see maybe potential pursuits for when ski racing is over? Like what, what gets you excited in life? That's not, uh, you know, it's not ski racing. Yeah. Well, so, so obviously the coffee thing is a part of what I've been doing on the side. So years ago, uh, Ralph Backstrom, who used, he used to be a professional snowboarder on the free ride world tour. Um, we were, we were, we were friends. We were talking, he was, he was, uh, roasting coffee at his house in, in squaw and I would swing by and taste this amazing, delicious coffee. And I was like, Oh my God, this is unreal. And mm -hmm. at that time, his sponsors were kind of, uh, not supporting him as much as they used to. And, and mm -hmm. his career was kind of starting to go a different path. And, and so we, we started talking and we're like, well, we should use some of the sponsorship dollar we're getting right now to start something that we can create future dollars with, you know? And so, uh, then I talked with Cody Townsend who started arcade belts with a couple of friends and, and how, how he had that same thought of like creating something that they can control their own destiny and create future yeah. dollars. And so, yeah, one thing led to another and we decided to go into business together and started yeah. this coffee roasting business in Truckee. And that was about five years ago now, um, five or six years ago. And yeah, I mean, so that's pretty fun. That's kind of a little side thing and that might turn into something bigger in the mm -hmm. future. But that's not really my true where my true passions lie. I think yeah. um, I've I've started to talk to a lot of my sponsors about supporting me after ski racing, and right. so far, like Cliff Bar and Pac and Palisades Tahoe and a few others have been really receptive to supporting me as I like try to go into more like adventure skiing, traveling around the world, right. like, like like the kind of stuff Darren's doing, huh? Yeah, kind of, kind of, but, but a little yeah. different. Like he's, he's yeah. more of like kind of the ski movie, like yeah. that side of things. But for me, it's more about like skiing in really remote, cool places and telling mm -hmm. cool stories and connecting mm -hmm. with cool people. Um, and so I've, I've like started oh, that man. whole process and, and so far, like I've gotten some travel budget from Pac and, and, um, yeah, I've, I've started to dabble in that a little bit. So that's something I really would like to do more, but then long-term I'm also, um, finishing up my degree in ski resort management and global mm -hmm. business um through sierra nevada university and unr and yeah. tim cohey is actually my professor he's he's the one who's been teaching me the the whole business um, yeah that's what he said so so yeah one day that might open up some doors and i have a lot of like amazing contacts in the ski industry whether it be at vale resorts or altera mm -hmm. um or just here at home at uh, the, the new private ski area that might be built at white wolf uh troy mm -hmm. caldwell over at white wolf so that, that i think yeah, there's a there's all sorts of opportunities for the future, and I haven't really set my mind on any specific thing yet. But yeah, um, I've always thought it'd be cool to build like a European style mountain hut somewhere um, mm -hmm. at at one of the local resorts and do like really good coffee and pastries. Awesome. And, like have a little mountain hut culture because that's like the coolest thing about skiing in Europe, and we don't have anything. Like I'd, that I'd support that. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, Marie Michelle has like some some really cool ideas to bring, uh, in Quebec, they have this, this, uh, Nordic spa culture. This it's, they're like these saunas, cold tubs, hot tubs, all these things that are built in the forest in, mm -hmm. in nature. And it's just like a place to go unwind and recover and relax after pushing yourself as an athlete or as a, just a mountain person being in the mountains, you know, and here right. in Tahoe, like our whole society, we push ourselves to the limit every day mm -hmm. and we're really bad at resting. And so, mm -hmm. um, one of her ideas in the future is to open up 
uh, a Scandinavian Nordic spa type experience here in Tahoe, which would be super awesome cool as well. Yeah. So yeah, so there's, there's, that's the, that's the quick version of a million things that we have in mind. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Well, Hey, I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, this has been really awesome to learn a lot more about you and have this conversation. It's personally extremely interesting to me, obviously, because of my background and love for the sport of ski racing and, and just, you know, having grown up the same generation as you and we were racing with you a little bit back in the day. For sure. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. And absolutely best of luck this season. I'm uh, cheering for you big time among um, many people. So yeah. uh, wishing you all the success. I appreciate uh, the the questions too. And it's, it's fun to, to chat from time to time about these bigger topics and, and it kind of helps me hit, hit the pause button too and reflect on, on certain things in life too. So yeah, really appreciate it. And uh, absolutely. Where can people find you online? And I mean, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I mean, yeah, my social media, like uh, through Instagram, I, I'm pretty bad at that. I, I kind of hate that side of the sport, but that's also like the easiest way for me to show what I'm doing and, and yeah. satisfy sponsors and kind of grow my online presence. So yeah. that's we can talk about that in another conversation. Cause that's a yeah, whole other yeah, yeah. world, man. I, as a musician, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure we yeah. probably share a lot of the beliefs, but it's the world we live in. Right. You know, it's, it is the, it's a necessary evil. Yeah. Um, I love connecting with people more like on a one-on-one kind of way, but that's really yeah. hard to do these days anyway. So yeah, yeah. The, the social media is a good way to kind of bridge that gap. So and just Travis Ganong. Yeah. At Travis Ganong. Yep. Cool. Very good. All right, Travis. Thanks so much, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of conversations for convergence. If you enjoyed the episode and would like to support the show or any of my musical endeavors, please head over to erichenryanderson.com slash mailing list. That's Anderson ending in S-E-N and sign up. I'm in the process of creating a fan-supported platform through Patreon, which I'll be launching in early 2023. So the best way to make sure you don't miss that announcement is to join my mailing list. You can also follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Eric Henry Anderson and on Twitter at EH Anderson Music. Music.